What's up everyone, it's Kati with MoneyVest. So in this video, we're going to cover the markets and I'm also going to be going over certain things that I feel like nobody seems to be talking about because I've seen a lot of headlines around how strong the economy is, how the economy is taking these 5% interest rates with a stride and we're seeing so much flourishing of the economy, productivity, everything is booming and we're, that's what we're going to discuss uh, in this video. As always, if you enjoy it, find it helpful, make sure that you drop a like and don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you're just joining us for the first time. Links to our Discord and Patreon is going to be down below. We do have the sale in the month of May for all individual courses. 50% off coupon code is going to be May 50. If you want to take advantage of that, it's only valid for the next few weeks here until the end of this month. And of course, join our Discord Patreon. The first week of the month is the best time to join. And of course, you get access to over 50 plus private videos and tutorials, including my 30 stock shopping list, my buy targets, intrinsic values, money vest index, as well as our Discord channels, including the trade alerts as well. So link's going to be down below. And do connect with me on Instagram. My handle is going to be CassWRP. So this was the state of the market here. Uh, you know, NASDAQ flat, S&P about as flat as it can be. The Dow Jones also very, very flat, up just over 44 basis points, pushing past 39,000. And this was the headline that, you know, I wanted to break down today because uh, how the U.S. economy adapted to the 5% interest rates. So over a year ago, this month, the Federal Reserve pushed its target interest rates to 5%, a step that seemed sure to cause ripples across the corporate landscape and the global economy as well. To a surprising degree, though, the world has taken the onset of 5% interest rates in a stride. So yes, we are seeing a lot of productivity. We're seeing a lot of growth in the U.S. economy. You know, very, very strong numbers coming in uh, as we're seeing, uh, you know, economic growth to be extremely tight. I mean, you know, regardless of where interest rates are, it's too surprised to many people, including Jerome Powell himself, has mentioned that this has been a very resilient U.S. economy. And uh, we have continued to move higher uh, as, as the GDP numbers have come out, despite such high levels of interest rates and unemployment continues to be super low. Uh, and we're seeing job growth very, very strong as well. What most people don't mention, again, it's mentioned in some articles, it's mentioned in some places, but what most people don't really talk about is the little details that I think are now shifting. There's an inflection point that's actually happening in the U.S., which is to do a lot with the return on capital, which has a lot to do with the debt levels that we're seeing in the U.S., and I think, you know, we've talked about this a couple of years ago. I mentioned this in several of my videos two years ago, three years ago. It wasn't a big issue back then because it was still manageable. It was still to a point where, okay, you know, there's there's this back sort of there's this thing in the back of our minds that debt levels are increasing. We're seeing, you know, something alarming numbers coming out, but it was still manageable. It was still something that was within control. But Fast forward two years, three years later, I mean, it's starting to get a little bit out of control with the number of deficits we're seeing, the number, the amount of spending we're seeing, the congressional budget offices estimates themselves. I've created a spreadsheet based on a simple compounding factor to help you understand where we could be in 10 years time with respect to the level of credit card debt, national public debt and a lot of other deficits that are being accounted for moving forward. And that's really where my big concern comes in is this is not a sustainable path. Many people have said this before. Jerome Powell himself has said this before. That this is not a sustainable path for the U.S. government and the Treasury Department to keep spending like there's no tomorrow. And these are, again, extraordinary times where the amount of deficits we're seeing out of the world wars scenarios is really, really unprecedented. So this right here is the chart which shows the federal debt which is the total public debt with the gross domestic product. And what you'll notice here is really what I want to grab your attention to is the blue line with respect to the green line. Now, what you'll notice is that before, before 2020, okay, let's just call this as like the, basically the decade, right? 2020 to 2030. This is the decade where I feel personally, there's been a huge inflection point. And I'll, and I'll tell you why, because when you look at any companies return on capital, right? Return on capital, meaning what is the productivity? What is the earnings? What is the cash flow? And then you divide that by the capital. Capital is equity and debt, right? So how much the company is using capital to produce those types of earnings and profitability, that's the return on capital. If you take a look at the country as a whole, right? The United States, and I'm not factoring in the equity part of it because equity is going to be fluctuating. The market prices for equities and real estate and bonds, everything is going to fluctuate every single day. But what is going to stay constant? It's the level of debt the U.S. economy is taking on. And you'll notice that 
before 2020, we really had the blue line, which is the total GDP. That's a gross domestic product. That's the productivity measure here uh, was higher and much better than the green line, which is the total public debt. So we obviously did have, of course, GDP growing at a faster rate and much higher than the total debt. So return on capital in, in all sense was very good. It was positive, meaning the, the debt that the U.S. government is taking on, the amount of debt, and of course, the deficits also accounted for, um, are returning very good productivity because we're seeing this line above the green line because productivity is more, GDP is higher than the actual national debt. But in 2020, you'll notice there was a big inflection point because after the pandemic, of course, spending increased significantly. Uh, U.S. government started printing a lot more money. They're, they're pumping up more, more liquidity into the economy. And what's happened is, of course, the green line's now taken over, right? The national debt is now greater and much bigger than the GDP of the United States. And this number is only going to get worse because just take a look at the, the, the angle of this increase. I mean, over here, you can still see a pretty reasonable increase. But over here, it's a little bit more par parabolic, right? It's now starting to increase on a more exponential manner than a linear fashion. And now I, I strongly believe that the return on capital, meaning the amount of debt and the deficits the U.S. government is taking on, the marginal benefit of that is decreasing substantially. So we're not seeing the same level of growth in the economy as opposed to we're seeing the, the increase in debt and the deficits, meaning the debt and the deficits are growing at a much faster rate than the GDP is. And that's exactly why the forecast says that by 2050 or whatever, uh, we're going to see, you know, the national debt to be almost at 180, 190, as much as 200 percent of the overall GDP, which is, of course, a pretty concerning number. Now, this right here is also regards to the credit card debt. Now, the reason why the economy is so strong, in my opinion, is because of the level of debt. Again, the U.S. economy is taking on, the consumers are taking on. So you'll notice that this was, uh, again, the credit card balances topped $1 trillion. Just think about that for a second. Credit card debt, which has the highest interest rate of 24 25%, is now topping a balance of over $1 trillion. And it also continues a trend of fourth quarter credit card debt increases. And since this quarterly report that began in 1999, credit card debt has fallen during the fourth quarter of, of a year just twice. Just twice, 2009 and 2010, uh, as a, of course the nation wrestled with the impact of Great Recession. Uh, while this latest increased credit card balance has risen $273 billion, so quarter trillion dollars in two years since fourth quarter of 21. Uh, and this right here is essentially what I feel that is a ticking time bomb that nobody seems to be talking about. That's the delinquency rates. Of course, interest rates are higher. You can see the significant increase in interest rates and where we have been over the last year at around 5, 5.25%. But this is where my focus is. This is the credit card delinquencies. Given how high interest rates are, given how high credit card balances are, it's no surprise that delinquencies are going to increase. And we are now at the highest level we have been in over 14 years. So if you go back basically over here, the last time you were at these levels was back, back in 2011. So about 13 years. So 2011 is where we were. 2011, end of 2011 to start of beginning of 2012 is where we were uh, for delinquencies. Um, so the moment, in my opinion, the moment we cross over that 4% threshold, which is where we were pre-2008, uh, is, is going to start sounding some alarm bells because this is the gap that we need to fill here. If we start filling this gap higher at 4% or higher, uh, I think that in itself is a huge signal that consumers are starting to now feel the pain for higher credit card balances, uh, which is going to result in one of two things. Either they're going to stop spending altogether and they're going to start managing that credit card balance, um, which of course is going to lower earnings, which is going to potentially increase the unemployment rate because companies are not going to be earning as much uh, anymore, uh, or they're going to keep spending. They're going to disregard all that and they're going to keep spending. And eventually it's going to be a ticking time bomb, which uh, again, the banks are going to be uh, you know, starting to shut down credit lines and they're going to start asking for money and you know payments and whatnot. And then this delinquency number obviously jumps to much, much higher at 6 7% that we saw back in 07, 08 during the great financial crisis. So one of those two things is most likely to happen, in my opinion, given that this is, again, a problematic thing. And this right here is the reason why credit card debt is increasing. It's because personal income is not growing at a faster rate as opposed to the CPI index. CPI, again, is the prices of all consumer items, right? So it's a basket of goods and services. So that's what we track. And we're not looking at the CPI year over year. What what is quoted by most media companies, uh, you know, looking at 3% or 4%. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about the year over year increase or decrease in inflation, but instead the overall price index 
for CPI. And what you'll notice is the blue line, that's the CPI index, right? This is the overall price increase for those basket of goods and services. And it's obviously gone in one direction, which is higher and higher over time. And that's how CPI works. That's how inflation works. Inflation is supposed to go up, but of course, at a moderate, more linear pace uh, and has to do with wages and real income as well. Income has grown at a much slower rate compared to inflation prices in general, you know, prices for homes, prices for goods and services. Of course, lack of affordability has increased in the U.S. because fewer and fewer people are able to afford the bare minimums because of, again, the wages have not grown at the same rate as overall prices for, for consumer items. So this is one of the reasons, this is the explanation why we have such a significant level of credit card debt is because wages alone, income alone is not enough to, to meet the requirements of people and families uh, because inflation is so high. And that's why they have to resort to using credit card, using debt uh, as a source of funding their lifestyle and just the bare minimums. Now, if you come over to the spreadsheet, which I have created, if you simply take into account the balance today for credit card, right, 1.1, 1.2 trillion dollars and an average credit card rate of 24%, which I know is quite ridiculous. And, and this is the problem, right? If this credit card debt level does not come down in 10 years, if there is no payments, if there's no payoffs, that's what I'm accounting for here just for explanation purposes. This number could go to over $8 trillion by 2033, $8 trillion in credit card debt alone in credit cards. That's it. Nothing else. No other form of debt, just credit cards. It could go from 1.1, 1.2 trillion to 8.2 trillion given the current average interest rate and the balance compounded over 10 years without any payments. This right here is of course the national debt and we're accounting for deficits of about 1.5 trillion this year. That's according to the CBO, Congressional Budget Office. And I'm growing that by 5% over the next 10 years to 2.2 trillion by 20. 33 and then adding that up to the current national debt because deficits are kind of being added on to the national debt and we're looking at well over 50 trillion dollars by the year 2034 those again are expectations here and if the economy somewhat stays let's say stagnant at you know 30 trillion growing at let's say two percent and then we grow that by uh let's just do 10 or uh, yeah 10 years uh let's see yeah just one second over here Yeah, so 36, 37 trillion dollars at 2% over 10 years. I hope that is correct. Let me just do that very quickly. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Yeah, so 36 and a half trillion dollars over 10 years at 2% growth. Uh, so if you do the math here, 55 divided by 36.57, uh, we're looking at about 150%, right? 150% debt to GDP number over the next 10 years. Estimated, I think, is closer to 166% for the US economy. So, but the bottom line is that these numbers are quite troublesome and this is only the national public debt. I mean, if you account for all other types of debt, mortgage debt, you know, you've got auto loans, you've got credit cards. I mean, then of course that number is going to be approaching closer to, I would say 70 to $80 trillion um, if this is not handled or managed in the correct manner. So yes, there is a lot of economic growth. Yes, there is a lot of productivity, a lot of job gains, a lot of a lot of really booming metrics that are suggestive of the idea that, okay, the economy is growing, but really on the back of what? On the back of, unfortunately, debt levels increasing. And this is pretty clear. I mean, if we were growing, if we were, if we were seeing higher levels of spending with stagnating credit card debt, I would be absolutely optimistic and I would be happy I'd be like, okay, this actual growth is coming off of income levels rising, wages are increasing, and people are spending more money because they're making more money, right? Not because they're borrowing more money, right? People are not spending money because they're borrowing. People are spending more because they're making more. That would be a much better sort of a situation than what it is right now. People are spending more because they're borrowing more, right? So that is, uh, I think, what we really need to be focused on long term as well, because this could eventually not saying today not saying tomorrow next week or next year eventually this is something that we will talk about i think eventually 10 years from now 20 years from now this is going to be one of the main topics of conversation is how to handle that debt what's going to be the end game um and what is eventually going to be the course of action 
uh, with respect to reducing some of that debt levels, including credit card and, of course, other other forms of debt. Uh, but anyway, so going back over to the market, so a little bit of a flat day. So again, every every single sector, kind of some of them higher, some of them lower. This was, again, the markets here. So utilities, financials pushing higher with most sectors down in the last one week. Everything is up. Technology, utilities, comp services, all 11 sectors pushing higher in the last one month. A little bit of a split market uh, with utilities, consumer defensives and comm services pushing higher with everything else down. Uh, ethanol, silver prices, cocoa, coffee prices, orange juice, everything pushing higher with oats, canola, sugar, cotton pulling back. Bitcoin just over 61000 and Ether just under $3,000 um, as well. So coming over to the market, uh, which is going to be where? So just give me one second. Let me bring that up. Um, okay, so this is going to be the markets here and boom here we go so volatility obviously selling off uh you know down at 13 right now so back down to the levels consistent inside this red rectangle so it's sitting between 11 and 12 um and of course you know the next time volatility spikes we're going to be ready to start buying dollar cost averaging once again um and, and really from a long trade perspective it's going to give us opportunity for some more levered etfs as well because really at the end of the day really our focus is going to be on this index this is you know what we have created on the channel we have created on this community money best index which tracks you know five to six different technical indicators using a very you know good formula that we've created to help us better understand when is the appropriate time to be buying into the market in the moment this drops below two or one i mean that basically means for me personally is a buy signal one of the best buy signals that i've tested and they yielded very, very good returns. So uh, we'll keep a close eye on this. Right now, we're in, the, in a little bit of a neutral range. And I know this can be frustrating for many people because you're looking for for, for things to trade. You're looking to do. You're looking for something to do in the markets. And when we are at a neutral neutral level, at around 3.6, 3.7, honestly, there's not a lot that we can do right now because we're not at overbought, overextended levels where we can start buying, let's say, you know, puts or we can start buying SQQQs or anticipating a pullback or a correction. We're also not down in the twos uh, where we can start aggressive dollar cost averaging. We were at a pretty reasonable level at three, which is exactly why I sent out my alerts in the Discord saying that, okay, you know, we're coming down to some very good attractive levels. We can start nibbling into the market here. Uh, but then, of course, we recovered back higher. S&P, NASDAQ, almost back up to all-time highs. And that's exactly the whole point is when this index drops, that's your trigger to buy. That's my signal to buy. Uh, and when it's back higher, it doesn't necessarily mean sell, but it just means that, okay, it's not the time to be buying. It's not the time to be super optimistic or aggressive in dollar cost averaging into the market. So we can just kind of sit back, sell calls, or basically wait for the markets to give us that next opportunity. Unless, of course, you're looking at, you know, long-term um, index funds and ETFs, broad-based ETFs, then, of course, you can dollar cost average on a periodic basis, uh, depending on your frequency. And so, again, you can kind of disregard this. But this is mostly for understanding where the risk reward is best uh, when we are looking at the markets. So 10-year treasuries uh, rebounding a little bit. So back over 4.5%. Uh, keep a close eye. You know, the recent highs were around 47 So we'll keep a close eye on that level as well. If you do get a breakout, then of course the next target is going to be closer to 5% uh, and support level is going to stay up at 4.33%. One more thing that I want to mention here is that the interest rate that I've taken here for the debt is 2.5%. This is actually going to increase over time. If I increase this to 3%, then now we're looking at $57 trillion. If I increase this to 4%, now we're looking at over 61, almost $62 trillion. And the reason for that is because as the U.S. government is issuing new debt, it's being issued at higher interest rates, right? Because interest rates now are higher than what they have been over the last 10 years. And so for that reason, I think the average interest rate on all debt is going to potentially increase. I think right now it's at somewhere around 2.75 uh, because again, most of the debt is old debt sitting at lower interest rates. But if this is going to increase, it's obviously going to increase the national debt because um, the interest payments and the deficits are growing, going to grow accordingly as well. So now moving over to um, S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. So this right here, SPX on the 30 minute time frame. What we're looking at over here is once again, a very nice uh, you know move to the upside, higher highs, higher lows, a little bit of consolidation sideways for S&P validating that support at 5167, 5200, exactly what we talked about in our previous videos. And resistance is going to stay put at 5189 to as much as 5200 on the S&P. And of course, the NASDAQ here also consulting sideways a lot. This right here is the nice uptrend, higher highs and higher lows. Resistance and that area of rejection is going to stay up roughly at 16,500. So keep that one in mind. And of course, 16,000 is going to be that support level 
to also watch for the Nasdaq. So very nice move to the upside, back up to almost all-time highs here. Uh, but this is not the time for me personally to be looking at buying aggressively or dollar cost averaging at the moment. Now coming over to Apple. So Apple here also just uh, consolidating sideways. So very, very flat. Nothing really changes from our previous analysis, but a little bit of a gap to fill on the downside. I would be a lot more interested, of course, at lower prices, lower levels, tier two and tier three support levels to watch for Apple. Uh, just waiting patiently for it to come down and give us those discounts and those deals for the long term here. Amazon, uh, 188. So again, consolidating sideways at that resistance, uh, pretty much the all time high. And that's going to be this red line over here. Uh, support level is going to stay put down to 171. Amazon, in my opinion, one of the highest growth companies for the long term. And I stand by it. I think it's got the most potential, even more so, I would argue, than NVIDIA or Tesla over the long term because uh, because it's just now turning the corner towards massive profitability. It's kind of set out the foundation, set out the structure for you know, it's uh, logistic network, AWS, advertising, everything's in place. And now it's game time for Amazon, in my opinion, over the next 10 years. So support level is going to stay put down to 171 uh, and pretty much the resistance and all time high at 189 to 190. Uh, talking about Tesla here, Tesla got bought up yesterday. Uh, there was a catalyst, which I believe was related to uh, uh, the malfunction or something related to FSD. I have to go back and check and I will be doing um, a video on Tesla here soon. So a more dedicated separate video on Tesla going over, uh, you know, the technicals and of course what I'm planning to do. I did uh, close my calls on Tesla, 94% profit on covered calls. And we'll be looking at selling once again, the moment it gets up to over $195, $200 again, another $20 jump here. And I'll be looking at selling calls again in the 230s and 240s because the premiums usually are very good when Tesla is, of course, very, very bullish and, of course, green on the day. So near term resistance at 177, support level here inside this green rectangle in the 150s for Tesla. Uh, talking about uh, PayPal. And PayPal here selling off quite aggressively down about 3%. So getting rejected here once again inside this red rectangle. So that's an area of supply. We've gone rejected here not once, twice, but three times even after the earnings got sold off intraday. But the real the real uh, question is going to be whether we get validated here at this higher low. So this right here is going to be that higher low for PayPal, it's still within the context of this uptrend, higher highs and higher lows. So resistance is going to stay put roughly at 68 to $70 and support level, of course, here at this higher low at 63 bucks for PayPal. Talking about Visa and Visa here also rebounding a little bit. So pushing up support level is going to stay put roughly at 264 resistance and targets all the way up to 290 for Visa as well. Very nice move to the upside. L3 Banker Oscillator does suggest there's some buyers stepping in. So keep that in mind. And again, resistance is going to stay put at 294 Visa. Uh, talking about PayPal, uh, actually PayPal, we already went over NVIDIA. So NVIDIA on the day, of course, flat and resistance right now testing around 909. So that right there is going to stay put as an area of resistance. Support level is going to stay put down at 845 for NVIDIA. We were in a downtrend, then we got a breakout. And right now we're just kind of coming up to that resistance at the moment. Earnings are coming up for NVIDIA very, very soon. Advanced Micro Devices, uh, very much in this downtrend. So still making lower highs and lower lows. And support level is going to stay validated here. It's going to be sitting roughly at 145 to as much as 150. Uh, and resistance is going to be all the way up to 164 for Advanced Micro Devices. So that's going to be that near-term resistance and target for Advanced Micro Devices. Uh, talking about Meta Platforms and Meta here continues to push higher almost at one percent green and we're just going to wait and see whether we get a breakout over 475 or not uh, we fill this entire gap so very nice recovery from meta after the earnings and i do think that meta reporting said good num such good numbers was a little bit of an overreaction from uh from investors and of course resistance now at 476 to 477 for the company all the way up to as much as 515 to 531 we'll go ahead and turn this level back into a support the moment it breaks out over 475 and stays and closes above that level uh talking about netflix and netflix also with a huge breakout above 596 that was the previous resistance now turned into a support and now the target and resistance is going to stay put at 635 to 636 for netflix a very nice recovery back higher rsi macd and the l3 banker oscillator everything looks good for Netflix to kind of recoup that target of 636 moving forward. Google, on the other hand, uh, just basically flat down about 1%. Uh, still a little bit of a gap to fill here. Support level is down in the 150s. And I would be a huge buyer of Google in, of course, the 130s and 120s. But we're, we're going to have to wait and see whether it comes down to that level. Still within the context of this uptrend. One of the very few companies here that's been trading in an uptrend of higher highs and higher lows. So very, very nice move uh, to the upside for Google here after the earnings. Uh, finally, come over to Microsoft and Enphase. And Microsoft here, resistance is going to stay put at 417. Uh, very flat day. Support levels inside this green rectangle, of course. Um, 
And uh, again, a lot of consolidation sideways in that range. So really, I mean, Microsoft has been trading in between this range over here. Resistance at 430, support at roughly at 394. So that's pretty much the range within which it's been consolidating for some time. Uh, Costco, on the other hand, uh, continues to move higher, of course. Huge resistance here. Support level is going to stay put at 747, down as low as 705 for Costco. And uh, we're just seeing a little bit of consolidation here. RSI, MACD, and the L3 Banker Oscillator all suggesting overbought conditions here. So I'd be super careful. Wouldn't be surprised if it does end up, let's say, down in the 740s or even down back in the low 700s again for Costco. But again, the valuation is a little bit higher and extreme at the moment. End phase is still within the context of this downtrend. So lower highs and lower lows. Support level is going to stay put at $106. Resistance all the way up to $138 bucks for end phase still within the context of this downtrend at the moment. So hope you all enjoy this video and a complete update on the markets here. The bottom line is that we got to be careful. We got to be aware of what's really driving and fueling growth here in this economy. But let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. As always, if you enjoyed it, found it helpful, make sure that you drop a like. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Also connect with me on Instagram. Handle is going to be castwrp. Join our Discord and Patreon. Over 50 plus private videos and tutorials, including all the trade alerts and the individual courses are going to be 50% off. Coupon code MAY50 valid until the end of this month. As always, happy investing. I'll see you all in the next video.